Islamic or Arab. Islamic philosophy is the investigation of the universe and man in the light of the religious teachings that were revealed with the emergence of Islam. Before we delve into this research and present the problems that this philosophy faced and tried to solve, it is worth detailing the issue of the title of this study, Is it an Islamic philosophy or an Arab philosophy? Because this distinction has an impact on the subject of this philosophy itself. Ancient historians addressed this issue, as did moderns, throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, especially after the emergence of Arab nationalism and the Arabs' sense of themselves and their entity. The ancients had one opinion, and the moderns had another opinion. When philosophy appeared in Islam, and this philosophy spread in the Arabic language, it grew and flourished, and philosophers such as Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, and others emerged, and historians wrote books that recorded their lives and opinions. These historians called them philosophers of Islam, Islamic philosophers, or wise men of Islam, as was said by Al-Sharistani, Al-Kifti, Al-Bayhaqi, and others. For this reason, Sheikh Mustafa Abdel Razek said in his book, a preface to the history of Islamic philosophy, 1. The people of this philosophy have given it a name that they have agreed upon, so it is not permissible to depart from it, and it is not permissible to quarrel over it. Then he concludes from that by saying, we believe that we should call the philosophy we are dealing with, as its people called it, Islamic philosophy, meaning that it arose in the lands of Islam and under its state without regard to the religion of its adherents or their language. When the Orientalist Professor Nellino came to give his lectures at the Egyptian University after its opening, he gave lessons on the history of astronomy among the Arabs, and was subjected to naming, and discussed the arguments that are said on both sides, and this is the text of his argument. Whenever talking about the time of pre-Islamic times or the beginning of Islam, there is no doubt that the word, Arabs, is used in its true, natural meaning, referring to the nation residing in the peninsula known as the Arabian Peninsula. But if we are talking about the eras following the first century of the Hydra, we take that word in a conventional sense, and we apply it to all nations and peoples residing in Islamic kingdoms, who use the Arabic language in most of their scientific works, so it is included in the naming of the Arabs the Persians, the Indians, the Turks, the Syrians, the Egyptians, and the Berbers, and the Andalusians, and so on, sharing books on the language of science, and being followers of Islamic countries. Even if we did not call them Arabs, we are almost unable to talk about the science of appearance among the Arabs. Due to the lack of skilled people among the children of Khartan and Adnan, it is clear from this text that Nalino depends first and foremost on the language, and that is why he said, science among the Arabs, means that it was written in the Arabic language. Then he quoted the opinion of Ibn Khaldun, in which he states that, most of the bearers of knowledge in the Islamic religion are foreigners. He then discussed the opposite side of this issue, we mean the statement of Islamic philosophy or Islamic sciences, and he responded to it by saying that the term, Muslims, excludes Christians, Israelis, Sabians, and people of other religions who have a significant share in Arabic sciences and classifications, especially with regard to mathematics, physical education, medicine, and philosophy. The term, Muslims, also requires searching for what the people of Islam have classified in languages other than Arabic, such as Persian and Turkish, and this is outside our topic. Thus, Nelino concludes with this result by saying, it is most likely that we agree on what is frequently used by modern writers, and we take the word Arabs with the aforementioned terminology, that is, in relation to the language of books, not the nation. A study appeared on the occasion of a seminar to study Islamic philosophy in Cologne in 1959 AD, which was conducted by our friend Father Karnawati and published in that year. Point two, it is a referendum that he directed to those working in this philosophy in various parts of the world, and he collected the responses and published them, from which it became clear that there was a strong difference in naming, from Islamic philosophy, to Arabic, 
to the philosophy of Islamic countries, to philosophy in the Islamic world, and so on. We will present some of these opinions because of their humor. Iranians, Indians, and Turks prefer to call this philosophy Islamic, and this is not surprising to them at the present time, after their connection with the Arabic language has been cut off, except for specialists only. Professor Moeng at the University of Tehran believes that calling Arabic philosophy excludes Iranians, Afghans, Pakistanis, and Indians, and he believes choosing a name such as Islamic philosophy, or the philosophy of Islamic countries and their surroundings. Professor Ashner says, if what is meant is the philosophical thought that spread in a part of the earth after the spread of Islam and the Arabic language, and which was always expressed in Arabic, and sometimes by the same authors in Persian, The French Orientalist Corbin, who specializes in Islamic and Iranian women, defends an Islamic philosophy by saying, if we took an Arabic philosophy, it would be very narrow and even wrong. So where do we place, for example, the thought of Nazir Khosrow, Afzal Kashani, and other Persians of the 11th to 13th centuries, who only wrote in Persian? As for the concept of Arabism, Today it carries a justifiable political and national content, but it has no right to take us back to the scientific or literary field. Also, I refuse to link a religious concept with a nation or race, and therefore the most correct title is, Philosophy in Islam, Islamic Philosophy, or, Philosophy in Islamic Countries, even if this last title is long and not suitable as a title. I refuse to call her a, Muslim, Musulman, because this is a prior ruling on the philosopher's personal belief. Islamic philosophy therefore includes everything. If we want to add Christians and Jews, we can say, philosophy in Islam, as Dabur did three before. The Indians oppose the statement of an Arab philosophy, and in this regard, Professor Tara Chan says, Arabic philosophy is an inappropriate title, firstly because the people working in this industry were not all Arabs, but most of them were Persians or citizens of other countries such as Egypt, Central Asia, Andalusia, India, etc. Although the text of this philosophy was written in Arabic, other languages were used, such as Persian and others. A more important consideration than that is that philosophy arose from the need of Islam and religious debate, and was primarily concerned with either consolidating the foundations of belief, seeking a philosophical basis for it, or developing verbal religious ideas. This philosophy cannot be considered critical or exploitative, because it revolved around religious thought. As for Christians and Jews who wrote philosophical works critical or influenced by Islam, they should be included in the totality of Islamic philosophy. A group of responses came that took Islam not only in the sense of religion, but in a more general and broader sense, that is, specific civilization, as Professor Buzani from Italy did. It takes Islamic philosophy to mean civilization, not religion. To give an example of Bergson, the Jewish philosopher, he is part of the history of Christian philosophy in Europe in the present era. Dr. Ibrahim Madka said something similar saying, it is not to say that Arabic philosophy is the work of a race or a nation. However, I prefer to call it Islamic, because Islam is not only a belief, but it is also a civilization, and every civilization has its moral, material, intellectual, and emotional life. Islamic philosophy therefore includes all philosophical studies written in the land of Islam, whether by the pens of Muslims, Christians, or Jews.
I do not need to mention the Nestorians, Jacobites, and Sabians who were the pioneers of these studies. You see that Ibn Maimon is nothing but a continuation of Al-Farabi and Ibn Rushd. The discussion would be long if we quoted everything else mentioned by those working in this type of philosophy, but I will conclude the topic with the opinion that I expressed in my book in the English language point four regarding Islamic philosophy, where I said what I translated, those who advocate Arabic philosophy hold that it was written in Arabic, and that it was first translated into Arabic, and then philosophers wrote about it after that and added to it in Arabic, but we must mention that. Translating Greek philosophy into Arabic is not a sufficient reason to say that it is Arab, because the imams of the philosophers were not Arabs, but rather Turks like Al-Farabi, or Persians like Ibn Sina. Because some philosophers were familiar with Persian, their thought nevertheless forms part of this philosophy. Islamic philosophy and theology. There is another issue that we should also elaborate on before continuing to tell the story of this philosophy, which is the distinction between philosophy and theology. Is Islamic philosophy, if we wish to seek it, the science of theology for Muslims, or is philosophy one thing and the science of theology another thing, completely different? Or is theology a branch of it? At the beginning of this conversation, you learned what philosophy is, and that it is research into the universe and man. We must provide you with a definition of theology that brings it closer to your mind so that you are aware of the matter. The science of theology is the strengthening of religious beliefs with rational arguments. If you go back a few pages and look at the discussion of the Indian professor Tara Chand on the issue of naming whether it is Islamic or Arab, you will see that he takes Islamic philosophy in the sense of theology, and there is no harm in repeating his statement again, which is that philosophy arose from the need of Islam and religious controversy, and was concerned with at its basis either by consolidating the foundations of belief, seeking a philosophical basis for it, or developing verbal religious ideas. Many historians hold this opinion, but I disagree with them for many reasons. First, because the science of theology, as it has become clear, has a religious basis, it is a religious science, and its counterpart in that era in Europe is the science of theology, or theology thesology, span, in Christianity, with some differences between Islamic theology and Christian theology, we do not wish to delve into them here, and this is not their scope. There is no dispute that philosophy is a type of study that differs from theology or theology, in method and subject matter. As for the method of philosophy, it is rational proof according to the ancient Islamists and Greeks, and as for the method of speech, it is argumentation, and as for the subject of philosophy, it is the universe and man, and looking into the principles of existence and its causes. There is no harm in the philosopher ending in his thinking to prove the existence of a first cause for this universe, which is God, or a mover. He created the world, as Aristotle did, and called God the mover who does not move. Some philosophers, such as the materialists, may go in their thinking to deny the existence of God, and say that matter is ancient and is the origin of itself but the subject of the talk is essentially God and his attributes, and God's connection to this world, and the human being who lives on this earth according to the law that God has revealed to his servants in his holy books. For this reason, Islamic theologians take the Islamic doctrine, as stated in the decisive revelation and in the book of God, which is the Qur'an, as an established matter that cannot be doubted, such as the existence of God, his oneness, his justice, and resurrection on the last day, and then they try to support it with rational argument. 
There is a strong difference between someone who enters the field of thought free from every previous opinion, and someone who enters this field bound by a previous belief that he cannot circumvent, even if he is able to interpret it. Secondly, philosophy is a Greek term that is foreign to the Arabic language, and it is applied in this language as it is. Al-Farabi stated this, saying, the name of philosophy is Greek, and it is foreign to Arabic. According to their language, it is philosophical, and it means cherishing wisdom. In their language, it is a compound of villa and sophia. Villa is altruism, and sophia is wisdom. The philosopher is derived from philosophy, and according to their doctrine, he is philosophos. This change is like changing many derivations according to them, and its meaning influences wisdom. Hence, we do not need to prove the foreign origin of Islamic philosophy. Because the word philosophy itself carries within it this foreign touch taken from the Greeks. As for Kalam, there is no doubt that it is an authentic Islamic science. Point five: The most likely opinion emerged from the discussions that took place about the Quran, which is the word of God. Is it ancient or created? This is the issue that occupied Islamic public opinion for a long period of time at the beginning of the Abbasid state, and Islamic thinkers from the Mutazilites, Hanbalis, and Ash'aris disagreed about it. However, researching the Word of God as one of his attributes, the Almighty, is not philosophy, but rather theology in Christian terminology, or speech in Islamic terminology. Third, at the beginning of the emergence of philosophy in Islam, we mean in the late 2nd and early 3rd century AH, there were philosophers who became famous by this name, and they were mentioned in history books and the biographies of the sages as philosophers. And they knew about it, such as Al-Kindi, who was known to them as the philosopher of the Arabs. They had famous theologians in history, such as Al-Nizam, Abu al-Hudhail al-Alaf, al-Jabai, and others, and none of the ancients said that these were philosophers. More than that, there were disputes between philosophers and theologians, and philosophers rose up to criticize the opinions of theologians and accuse them of weakness and inconsistency, and they wrote treatises about that. The situation remained in this manner throughout the 3rd, 4th, 5th, and even 6th centuries of the Hydra, until we find Al-Ghazali, who was initially considered one of the Ash'aris, i.e. theologians, writing his famous book called, the incoherence of the philosophers. We find Ibn Rushd, the philosopher, refuting this accusation from philosophy and philosophers in his book, The Incoherence of the Incoherence. The existence of a distinct group of philosophers, such as Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, Ibn Chufail, and Ibn Rushd, different from another group of theologians, such as Al-Nizam, Al-Alaf, or Al-Ash'ari, indicates clearly and beyond doubt that Islamic philosophy was a type of study that differed from, if not in conflict with, theology. Indeed, after the 6th century AH, philosophy became mixed with theology, to the extent that this latest science swallowed up philosophy completely and contained it in its books, until the books of monotheism, which examined the science of theology, began with an introduction to Aristotle's logic in the manner of philosophers, in addition to extending natural and mathematical opinions in time, space, movement, etc., as is evident from looking at one of the books of the later scholars in this science, such as the book, al Mawakif by al -Iji. Then, over time, Muslims began to fear philosophy due to the accusations that were made against it that labeled it as disbelief and atheism. People turned away from it, and engaging in it, examining it, and teaching it became something forbidden, and the situation remained in this manner until the previous century, until philosophy came into existence once again, and spread within it. Life at the hands of religious scholars from the leaders of thought, headed by Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, then the Professor Imam Sheikh Mohammed Abdul after him, then Mustafa Abd al-Razak and his students and school. Thus, Islamic philosophy returned to separation once again from the science of theology, as was the case before in the Abbasid state. 
This opinion of Ibn Khaldun in his introduction supports what we are going for, and clarifies the stage of separation between philosophy and theology, and then the stage of their integration. We convey it in its entirety in response to those who argue that Islamic philosophy is the science of theology. Ibn Khaldun said, And know that when theologians used to infer, in most cases, from beings and their conditions, the existence of the Creator and His attributes, this is often the type of their reasoning, and the natural body is considered by the philosopher in natural things, and it is some of these beings, except Philosophy and Sufism. If this was the case of philosophy and theology, and the separation of one from the other until the 6th century, as we have seen, then this is also the case of philosophy and Sufism. Indeed, the separation between them is more severe and the difference is greater, as they differ in method and subject matter. Philosophy looks with the eye of reason and follows the path of reasoning and logic, while Sufism follows the path of struggle and observation, and speaks with the tongue of taste and situation. Philosophers are possessors of proofs, and Sufis are masters of tastes and essences. The subject of philosophy is knowing the facts of things of any kind, whether natural, mathematical, or metaphysical beyond nature. In this last type, knowledge of God Almighty is included, and this subject is looking into the universe. As for looking at a person, it includes researching his behavior from the point of view of ethics and politics, and this view is what the ancient Islamists called practical philosophy. The subject of Sufism is essentially knowledge of God, whether through legitimate worship or through inspiration and taste. Therefore, the Sufis were called, at the beginning of their path, from the late 2nd century and throughout the 3rd century, ascetic worshippers and the poor because they increased their worship and conditions of asceticism and piety beyond the limits prescribed by Sharia law. Sufism in this role is nothing other than adhering to religious morals, and from here came the definition of Sufism as entering into every sunny character and leaving every worldly character. Then the research into Sufism moved from being asceticism, worship, asceticism, and poverty, to being a progression of states and stations until the Sufi reaches the state in which he is with the truth, and becomes a manifestation, a witness, and a behold. Since Sufism is a personal state, and does not depend on the Sufi himself, but rather on divine conquests, you cannot expect a single definition for this art as long as it is subject to personal mood. We mention some of these definitions that you will find, for example, in the book, Definitions by al -Jujani. Sufism is, purifying the heart from conformity with the wild, abandoning natural morals, suppressing human traits, avoiding psychological claims, competing with spiritual qualities, attaching to the sciences of truth, and using what is more important than eternity. And sincere advice to all the nation, and loyalty to God Almighty in the truth, and following his messenger, peace be upon him in the Sharia it was said, abandoning the choice. It was said, giving the unknown, and becoming familiar with the deity. It was said, preserving your senses by paying attention to your breathing. It was said, turning away from objection. It was said, taking facts, speaking in minutes, and despairing of what is in the hands of creatures, 
etc. Our purpose is not to delve into Sufism for its own sake, but we only want to show that it is a type of study that differs from philosophy. Indeed, in his later eras, Sufi theories were formed that called for unity, solutions, or unity of existence, which indicates that Sufism was influenced by philosophy. However, what happened is similar to what happened to the science of theology, when it swallowed the doctrines of philosophers in its stomach. There is no clearer evidence of the dissimilarity of philosophy, theology, and Sufism than what Al-Ghazali mentioned in, The Saviour from Error, where he depicts his fluctuation between these studies when he says, as for what follows, you have asked me, O brother in religion, to convey to you the purpose of the sciences and their secrets, and the depths of the doctrines and their depths, and I will tell you what his difficulty in extracting the truth from the confusion of difference with the contrasting paths and methods, and what I first benefited from the science of theology, secondly, what I found of the methods of scholars who were limited in attaining the truth by imitating the imam, thirdly what I disdained of the methods of philosophizing, and lastly what I was satisfied with of the method of Sufism. Although Al-Ghazali had finally accepted the path of Sufism and preferred it to other paths of theologians, mystics, and philosophers, the theologians do not accept the path of Sufism, nor do they recognize inspiration, which is the basis of Sufi knowledge, among the paths of knowledge they follow, which are the sound senses, true information, and reason, and thus they distinguish between themselves. There is a clear distinction between Sufis. As for the philosophers, they oppose the theologians on the one hand, and they oppose the Sufis on the other hand. You can read Ibn Rushd's book, Revealing Methods of Evidence in the Doctrines of the Sect, to see how he stands by the two teams. He faults theologians for the lack of reliability of their arguments and evidence, and that they do not reach the certainty of proofs and logical analogies, and he faults the Sufis for the fact that their methods of theorizing are not theoretical methods. Rather, they claim that knowledge of God and other existence is something that is thrown into the soul when it is stripped of lustful symptoms, and this method, even if we accept by its existence, it is not common to people as people. If you know that Ibn Rushd died in the year 595 AA, Philosophy and Jurisprudence If philosophy was foreign in its origin from which it was transmitted, then it developed after that at the hands of Islamic philosophers, and theology and Sufism were sciences that were influenced by foreign Christian, Persian, and Indian elements, to the point that many believed that they were also alien to Islam. However, some researchers sought authentic Islamic philosophy in theology. Sheikh Mustafa Abdel Razak saw that the science of jurisprudence was more important, and he called in his book, A Prelude to the History of Islamic Philosophy, that the science of jurisprudence was invented by al shafii as an innovation and established it as a norm, and that one who examines al shafiis treatise will discover the aspects of philosophical thinking. In this regard, he says, al shafiis treatise, as we have seen, follows, in the narration of its topics and the arrangement of its chapters, a pattern established in the mind of its author. Its consistency may sometimes be disturbed, its sequence may be hidden, digression is exposed to it, and it is accompanied by repetition and ambiguity. However, for all of that, it is a strong beginning for scientific writing organized in an art that al shafii combines. For the first time its first elements. 
If we allude in the treatise to the emergence of philosophical thinking in Islam from the point of view of attention to controlling branches and details, with comprehensive rules, even if we do not neglect the aspect of jurisprudence, that is, deducing subsidiary legal rulings from their detailed evidence, then we hint to philosophical thinking in the treatise in other aspects, including the logical tendency to establish definitions, and the borders first, etc. Indeed, our professor Mustafa Abdel Razek opened a door worthy of research and attention, but jurisprudence and its principles are both legal sciences, not philosophy in the conventional sense. This is until the science of jurisprudence itself was later influenced by Aristotelian logic, as is evident from looking at the name of the fourth principle of jurisprudence, which is analogy. Philosophy and Science Jurisprudence, Sufism, and theology are religious sciences. It is no wonder that they conflict with philosophy and try to remove it from the field of life. In the end, religion prevailed, and it triumphed over philosophy and forbade engaging in it. It condemned the philosophers to disbelief and accused them of atheism. But most researchers in the history of Islamic philosophy ignored the source from which philosophy emerged, and they missed that it was based on the mathematical and natural sciences, not on the basis of religion. Indeed, philosophy looks at natural beings to guide them to the existence of the Creator. But this view is the crown of philosophy, and the most honorable part of it, and that is why it is called theology or divine science, as Aristotle said. This aspect can only be worked on by those who have finished examining the various sciences, trained in them, and become proficient in them. In this sense, every philosopher was a scientist in the mathematical and natural sciences, but not every scientist is a philosopher because it may stop at the limit of a certain knowledge that is specific to it and does not exceed it. Many scholars in various branches of science have become famous among the Arabs, and it is enough to read the book al firist by Ibn al-Nadim, for example, to see the names of engineers, astrologers, doctors, chemists, arithmeticians, and other things. To know the extent of specialization in these branches. In addition to this, there were philosophers who were skilled in the sciences first, and then rose from it to philosophy. This was the case of Ulkindi, the Arab philosopher who excelled in the mathematical sciences, and was considered one of the greatest astronomers. The same can be said about Ibn Sina, whose fame spread as a doctor of horizons, or Al-Biruni, who excelled in the science of form. The situation remained in this manner. We mean that only those who delved into the sciences, especially the science of medicine, became famous for their philosophy, until the time of Ibn Rushd, who was a physician who wrote the book al Kalfi al-MDB, and in addition to that, he was a philosopher. Even if the later scholars, after the 6th century AH, were satisfied with researching the philosophical issues raised by the ancients, without relying on the scientific basis on which those issues were based, the connection between philosophy and the earth, which was nourished by water and with blood flowing in its arteries, was severed, and it became a head without a body, and a body. He was devoid of a soul, so she died. It did not begin to be revived until the end of the last century, when the East returned to science again. But the battle is no longer between philosophy and religion at the present time. Rather, it has become a bitter battle between science and religion, which is still raging to this day. Religion, science, art, literature, industry, and economics are the things that distinguish the civilizations of nations, and they are all intertwined with each other, affecting each other. Religion, science, and philosophy played a role on the stage of Islamic civilization. Philosophy was armed in its struggle with the weapon of science and raised its banner. When it was possible to reconcile these three aspects of knowledge, the Islamic civilization flourished and its status rose, and the support of the Islamic countries strengthened and its area expanded, extending from the easternmost part of India to Andalusia in Morocco, at a time when the Islamic civilization flourished. 
when philosophers moved away from researching the sciences, and the later ones confined themselves to explaining the books of the earlier ones, Islamic philosophy weakened and became barren, scholastic, until it was doomed to isolation, and only religion remained on the stage. Footnotes 1. If anyone wants to learn more about the discussion of this issue, please refer to this book. 2. See magazine video, tome 5, 1958-1959. 3. See the history of philosophy in Islam, written by Dabur and translated by Dr. Muhammad Abd al-Hadi Abu Raida. 4. A. E. L. Ewani, Islamic Philosophy. Anglo-Egyptian Library, Cairo, 1957. 5. Our purpose in this book is not to delve into the science of theology. Is it purely Islamic, or did it arise under foreign influence? Especially discussions about God and his attributes in Christianity. The same is true of Sufism, as some believe that it is Islamic and its origins are found in the Qur'an and Sunnah, while others believe that it is an alien science in Islam from Indian and Persian Sufism in particular.